Hello, good evening and welcome to the UK CIC webinar, COVID-19, Vaccines and Protective Immunity. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Erica. I lead on our patient involvement and public engagement work within UK CIC. But you may have joined us, but you may be wondering what UK CIC is. So I'm going to spend a couple of minutes just talking you through the UK Coronavirus Immunology Consortium. So we are a group of immunologists from around 20 research institutes around the UK that came together during the pandemic to answer some really important questions about how our immune system interacts with coronavirus. And we are funded by the UKRI and the NIHR and kindly supported by the British Society for Immunology. If you want to find out a bit more about us, then check out our website, ukcic.org, and follow us on social media or even drop us an email. Um, please do check out all of the work that we do. We are going to be talking about one specific element of the work that we've been doing around COVID research and vaccines, but there's so much more on the UKCIC website around the research that we do. So what does UKCIC hope to achieve? So we've been funded for 12 months, and in those 12 months, we really want to bring impact on and benefit for patients and public health when it comes to COVID-19. So this is a huge collaboration between the UK's best immunology researchers and institutions, um, and really it's bringing people together in a really quick scale to deliver impact. And by understanding the immunology of COVID-19, hopefully will bring this pandemic under control. And all of this new knowledge that we've been hoping to achieve over the last 12 months is really going to bring improvements for patients. And this new knowledge will contribute towards diagnostics, treatments and vaccine design. And through our policy work, we also hope, hope to influence public health measures. But today we're going to be talking about protective immunity and vaccines and COVID-19. So our PPI panel, so our patient and public involvement panel, sits within UKCIC um, to really guide and advise our researchers. And it's super important within UKCIC to bring that unique perspective to the research because it's going to impact patients and public groups. And our PPI panel is made up of 10 members. And one of our members is here today and be joining me in hosting this webinar. Um, and really the PPI panel is working together with the researchers to really make sure that the science and the questions that the researchers are asking are really what matters to patient and public groups. And that really drives better research and greater impact with the work of UKCIC. And I'm going to introduce Tony Kelly, who's one of our PPI panel representatives. And this diagram really shows the strengths of our PPI panel, which is really diverse. But I'm going to let Tony introduce himself and the PPI panel. Hi, Tony. Hello, Erica. Thanks, thanks for um, having me on this particular webinar. Uh, first of all, I must thank the over 250 people who have decided to forego the footy <laughs> and the Wimbledon tennis to come and learn more about um, the whole issue of the virus and what it's about and what we within the patient and public involvement arena are about. I'm Tony Kelly, I'm Birmingham based, and I sit on a lot of August bodies, including this one. This particular one is to do with the um, coronavirus. I am from a background where I have had diabetes for 17 years, ladies and gentlemen, but in those 17 years, I've never taken medication. Physical activity and diet, a combination of the two. It runs in my family, it's hereditary, British born but grew up in Jamaica, but um, saw all the various things happening to my relatives in Jamaica and decided when it came my way 18 years ago, this Christmas coming, I am going to take the necessary steps to keep the complications at bay. So I'm very passionate about grassroots and community roots involvement in terms of medical researchers, academics, consultants, also involving us, the public, hence the issue of public patient and public involvement. And I'm involved in this one and really looking forward to the discussion we're going to have today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. So Tony and myself will be taking questions towards the end um, after our presenters have spoken. So please do pop your questions in the question box. They'll be filtered through to us. So please do put your questions in because we'll be having a really interesting discussion. 
but I want to introduce our speakers. So um, we have two speakers with us today and they both work on the protective immunity theme through UKCIC. So we have Professor Paul Clenneman, who's from the University of Oxford and he works very closely with Professor Susie Dunahy, who also is at the University of Oxford. And they'll be presenting for a short 20, 25 minutes. And then, as I say, we'll be taking questions. So Paul, um, I think, is Paul going to join me maybe in a second? Um, so Paul leads on the research theme around protective immunity, but he's also leading the Oxford Immunology COVID-19 response team. As part of UKCIC, his team has done lots of work studying how the immune system responds to COVID-19 after vaccination and natural infection. Susie collaborates with Paul on a number of studies um, and they've been really important to, to develop what we know about COVID-19 and vaccines. So I'm going to hand over to Paul. Great, can everybody see that? Um, well, thank you for having me. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about the, this uh, work that we've been doing. Um, I'll try not to show too many uh, kind of detailed data slides. I'll just show a few um, and give everybody plenty of time to ask us questions. I think uh, we should do that and it will be a, a double act between me and Susie. Um, so just to, to set the scene, and I know Tony and some of the panelists have seen this before, but just to kind of reiterate, there's different uh, kind of roles the immune response can play, but we all recognise, and it's, it's still the case, that um, uh, when you're infected with SARS-CoV-2, as millions of people have been, that, that some people end up with a, a relatively mild illness, indeed asymptomatic. Um, others have uh, kind of at the opposite end of the spectrum, you know, very severe illness. Um, leading on to uh, death despite the best efforts of the, the hospital. So um, this is a, a massive range of outcomes and, and as time has gone on it's clear that the immune response that you make to the, the virus is an important part in determining these. We know from the beginning that age and sex and the underlying disease status of, 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 of the person who's infected play a role but the kind of details of the immune response are harder to uh, kind of pull out but they've come out uh, you know over time. So I mean, obviously part of this is then what sorts of bits of the immune response are really helpful and, and how can we induce those with vaccines. So the bits of the immune response that people are focused on are starting with the innate immunity. Now this is a much by far the hardest bit to examine because it happens early, it happens just at the lining of the airways um, where the virus is entering but it, it's actually the most important and that some of the genetic studies uh, uh, and, and other sorts of pieces of evidence have really shown how important these, these, these frontline workers are. So type 1 interferon or interferon alpha is, is really crucial and, and changes in that can, can make a big difference to people's clinical outcome. Um, the, the other, there, there are other cells in, in there as well that, that, can, that can respond. I've, I've just highlighted a few, but there are T cells, which I'll come back to a bit later, that sit in, in the lining that, that can respond early. And there are antibodies that can be secreted into the lining. Again, these, these bits that are in your nose and airways are much, much harder to study than things that, that you can see with a blood test. And these are the very earliest events have the kind of biggest effect on, on, the, on the outcome because um, they're, they set the scene basically for what's to happen later. Now, once the um, innate response has, has played a, a role, and, and it, I should say that the, the coronavirus that's affected the SARS-CoV-2 is quite good at evading these innate responses. So it, they, it sort of finds a way around or doesn't really activate them the way they would like to be activated. Um, the, the next part of the immune response is the adaptive response, and so that forms two parts, the T cells, which our group and, and our role in the UK kick is, is really focused on. Those go out to the tissues and they'll kill infected cells. And we know that these are necessary for very many viruses. And, and actually very early on, people recognize that they were induced. And the, the, the problem about those is that they need a little while to warm up so that um, the, the, the virus needs to be carried to a, a local lymph node. There are T cells already there that can respond, uh, but they need to be expanded. You need to generate from one T cell thousands of T cells and they need to go off into the tissue and do their job. So that, that's a little bit slow. Um, takes a week or two to really ramp up, um, but but those are important. And then the, the ones that everybody will have heard of are antibodies. The same process has to happen. It takes a couple of weeks for the antigen, in other words, bits of the virus, to get to the lymph node for the B cells in this case to get activated. Again, you've all got B cells ready to kind of go. They, they, with the B cell, you can actually educate them really cleverly so that they can become more and more effective against the, the virus. 
Um, but again, it takes a couple of weeks to get to a, a level of B cells and a level of antibody from those B cells that we can really detect. And those antibodies circulate in the blood, so they're easy to measure and they form the basis of many tests. Um, and they're also off, back in the lining of the of the airways, um, that, and those are less well measured, but probably equally important. So our studies, and, and um, Erica introduced it, I mean, we'd want to do stuff that's useful. Um, so the original studies were what, how do people uh, develop immunity after natural infection? And then, of course, all these questions change and the vaccine came along and then the question changed to what the vaccine's doing. And, and there's still further questions, of course, about how the vaccine works with variants, whether we need boosters and so forth. So, so it's, 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 you know, it's actually quite hard to keep up, but those are the two main questions we've tried to address. Now, I just thought I'd give a bit of context to this because so we, we are involved in this UK kick. Um, uh, consortium. We've set up a, a large consortium of, of, of studies of healthcare workers. So these are you know, generally relatively healthy people, their working age, um, actually largely 75% uh, women. Um, and um, But that's kind of a, a very good study cohort, partly because they're very highly exposed. So many of them we could study for the kind of natural immunity. And then they were also the first to get vaccinated. So th they've been a very good um, uh, group for us and that we've got a, at least 2,000 across the different sites. But um, and Susie will go into this in a bit more detail, but the, it, it is important to have that, that kind of healthy control group because that gives us a, an anchor point to understand what's happening in people who have different immune systems. So there are these other studies I've highlighted, Octave and this COVAD, where people who've got uh, different kinds of Im immune compromise are, are being uh, recruited and, and uh, studied. There's a bigger group of, of healthcare workers called SIREN, which you might have he heard of, which, which helps us understand how our, how our immune responses work with protection. And then we've linked in as controls and, and reference points for back all the vaccine trials, which have led to you know the, the vaccine that, that many of you will have had, um, and also studies, which I won't go into, of, of acute disease, um, so that the sort of the scene that's set in acute disease puts the kind of the, the sets the immune system up for the later um, uh, memory, which is the kind of focus of our studies. How does memory, the immune memory that you generate, how does that really protect you? And also just to kind of emphasize that this is a really good collaboration between lots of different groups. So although both of us are talking today from Oxford, actually they're, they're folks in um, Liverpool, Newcastle, Sheffield, Birmingham, that we're all talking all the time. We've also shared, and I think this is a technical point, but it's nice to, to tell you that we've shared all our assays between these groups and we can run basically the same tests in different sites. We had to set these all up from scratch, of course, in a hurry. Um, and, and traditionally, it's been very hard to compare sites, but because we've done it as a team, it's worked really well. And that's one of the kind of legacies, I think, of COVID and one of the, the things that Britain should be proud of, that we've managed to coordinate this so well. I'd show this one slide. It's our kind of workhorse assay, the Ellisport, but not to dwell on it too much, but basically you, you offer little bits of peptide that represent the proteins in, in the virus. It's quite a big virus, a lot, lots of choices, but this is um, uh, these are peptides from the spike, which you will have heard of because that's in the vaccine. And this, this, the spike um, peptides are presented to the T cells. And if, if the T cells can recognize the, the, the virus, they will, they will um, create a spot on the plate. People who haven't had um, the infection or haven't had the vaccine don't create any spots at all. It looks like the, the one on, on, the, on the A6, the one on the left. People with a nice response, you can easily count those spots with a machine and so you can measure the T cell response. And that's what we're going to kind of use to tell how good the T cells are and what they're doing. So I'll show you a little bit of data. Um, how long do the re immune responses last? We've got some ideas about that. And then um, I, we can discuss whether there's some differences. We are not going to dwell on that too much, but it is important to recognize that not everybody looks the same. That's one of the things about the immune response. The genes that control it are uh, the most variable ones in the human genome. Um, and we all have different immune systems. So it's, it's really complicated to kind of say your immune response looks exactly like this. There's a huge variability. So in the effort to avoid showing too many graphs, I, I, basically this is just a cartoon of what your immunity, whether it's T cells or B cells, what they look like before the infection. Just after the infection, you get you know, quite a strong response to COVID. It's nice that everybody can agree on that. And about six months later, there's quite a lot of it has declined, um, whether you look at T cells or B cells, um, that 
include some people where it's declined not very much and some people where it's declined rather a lot and effectively that just depends where you start off and the people who've made the bigger response actually generally end up with the bigger response so we've measured all that and and we know from the siren study that over those six months you've got pretty good levels of protection against reinfection with the same virus um, so that's really helpful um, so we can kind of correlate the two things what we can't do necessarily is prove exactly what level is is kind of protective we just know roughly uh, where we are in this study which I, I, well, I we, we presented it's going to be published hopefully fairly soon is essentially asking this question so how well does a single dose of Pfizer work so lots of people in the UK have still only had a single dose of vaccine um, many people have had two doses now um, and we could answer this question quite early on in back in sort of March, April time, we, we were able to, um, or even earlier, we were able to get the data together quickly because healthcare workers got their first vaccine. And then we recognized quite early on that, that it makes a big difference whether you've had infection before. So if you look um, again, if you've previously not been infected after a single dose of vaccine, actually it was surprisingly good. There was some doubt as to how a single dose would really work. Um, but uh, and th there was a lot of discussion, if you remember back in the, in the press about extending the the the, uh, the interval between the doses. But a single dose will generate a, a reasonable response. Um, if you've had the uh, infection, you you have a kind of reasonable response to start off with, and then you get a huge boost from the from even a single dose of the vaccine, which takes you up roughly to the level of, of two doses with the vaccination. That two doses gives you a very strong response. So that's uh, that was nice to show um, and. Um, the, the sort of basically the, the memory that you've generated is, is very powerful. It's a sort of just get, show it a little bit more vaccine, it'll get a, a, a massive response. So it's functional memory, and that's probably why it's protective. The, the twist to the story is that the variants do make this slightly harder. So if this is the only piece of data I'm going to show, but basically it's exactly what I showed you before. And what we're looking at is neutralization so these are antibodies that really protect you against the virus by blocking the entry um, so if you don't have any um, uh, previous infection and before the vaccine you don't have any antibodies and after a single dose you generate on average you know a, a kind of some antibodies as i said it's really variable um, but those antibodies are roughly the level of somebody who's had previous infection so we know that's protected so that's good um, if you've had previous infection that as I said the antibodies are, are, are boosted really strongly so this is a log scale so that's a hundred and that's a thousand so they're, they're very very big effects of, of the vaccination which is brilliant but but as in anybody listening will know that the, the public health England have been, been um, very keen that everybody gets a second dose and this is the reason so after first dose with the B variant which is the original Wuhan or what we call Victoria the original strain that swept the world um, that's the level of neutralization that you get after one dose. But if you if you were to test the same antibodies against um, the South African variant, that actually they don't do that well because there's a drop off every time you, the variant uh, a variant occurs. It, it's it's generally been less well recognized by the antibodies. If you look at the people who've had who've got these high levels of antibodies um, at the top. Um, there is a drop off, but it's not it does. You're still left with a lot of antibodies. So so that's why the second dose is kind of important. Um, and just after a single dose, you haven't quite lifted things enough to get off, you know, a, a sufficient level of antibodies. So there's no real mystery to it. It's just about how much of a response you make and that the reason and this is work that we've supported by providing essentially samples to others um, is um, because the 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 spike as a particular shape. So the shape looks a little bit like this torso of this muscular uh, bloke um, with no arms. And the, the antibodies, um, so the spike, this spike here um, that will, will bind to the, um, is a spike of the virus and it will bind to the human cell, the so-called ACE2 receptor. And you can make antibodies that stop that happening, but when the antibodies bind at particular regions. So if, if you bind the belly button or somewhere around the back, it's not gonna do it. It needs to bind the shoulders, shoulder sort of areas. And that's exactly where the virus is making the mutants. And you can watch this evolution happening in, in real time. So we know exactly why these problems occur. So I'll pass on to Susie now. And um, but just to say that we, we the next step is to try and really understand what we've done with these long interval um, 
doses. We're the only country that really kind of launched that. And I think it was, uh, you know, it's been very interesting to see the differences and the similarities between the, the regimens. And we can discuss that, the differences between vaccines. Susie's going to talk about specific patients and, and, and how we can predict things. And, and we obviously want to understand how things go in future. So we, we need to kind of keep this going, even though UK Kicks only funded for a year. We, we've tried to find ways to sustain this. So over to Susie. Right. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for taking the time to join today. I'm just going to follow on from Paul's talk to discuss people with health conditions. So Paul and I are both infectious diseases doctors as well as immunologists, and we spend a lot of time talking to patients and hearing from people who are concerned because um, they have underlying health problems, which make them concerned that they may not respond to vaccines as well as people without such conditions. And I, I've put a few health conditions here. This isn't an exhaustive list, but people who are particularly worried are those with organ transplants, such as kidney transplants, liver transplants, bone marrow transplants, blood cancers, and what we call solid cancers, which is essentially cancers which aren't blood, so lung cancer and other cancers people with advanced kidney and liver disease. And then there's a lot of people, um, and some of you um, may be on this call, who need to take quite strong immunosuppressive drugs for conditions such as rheumatology, gastrointestinal and others. And as you will know, if you have to take such medicines, this is actually a big range. So you, you might be taking a drug that just has a, a mild to moderate effect on your immune system, or it might have a stronger effect and, and you may no, not know how strong the effect is when it comes to vaccines. And when it comes to uh, the COVID vaccines, um, it's a new virus and new vaccines. So scientists like ourselves are still learning as well. Next slide. So what we're finding is that the speed of science isn't fast enough to answer our new clinical questions. So when we have a new question we want an answer to, we have to do quite a lot. So first of all, we need to design studies, get funding, get ethical approval, make sure we've got the staff and all the supplies and all the procedures such as giving vaccines are done. We do lab tests and then we analyze the data and then we communicate it. And that's the usual process and it's slow. And crucially, we don't like to just act on one study. So what we like is a group of scientists to do a study, tell us about the results, and we say, oh, that's interesting. And we like to see two or three more good quality studies giving similar messages. And um, so we know that that one study, there wasn't something a bit odd about it. And what we find in COVID-19, first of all, we're having to act a lot on what's called expert opinion, where you don't wait for those scientific studies. So uh, the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, or GCBI, is a good example. It's a group of experts and they do look at data and scientific studies, but some of the decision making has to be on expert opinion based on previous viruses, previous vaccines, and an understanding of immunology and underlying conditions. There's been an awful lot of fast tracking as well. There's very much been an all hands on deck approach. So. Um, lots and lots of people giving their time when it's not their day job and rapid sharing of results. So scientists putting their scientific results up on what we call preprint form. So you'll see in the media, they'll say scientists have found this in a study that has not yet been peer reviewed. So usually we, we send our scientific findings off to a medical journal and other scientists do what's called a peer review and say whether it's any good or not. And then we adapt it. But now we're just putting our science out there immediately um, to help share the knowledge. And then it undergoes peer review in due course. So all, all the things we're trying to do to get answers fast. Uh, next slide. So I wanted to tell you specifically about the Octave study. Um, and actually, Paul, who spoke before me, is, is a genius at coming up with these names of trials. So Octave is an observational cohort trial of t for T cells and antibodies and vaccine efficacy um, in SARS-CoV-2. And this is led by a researcher in Glasgow University, but involves um, organisations and uh, hospitals all around uh, the UK. Um, if you could press next, Paul. 
So what we've done with this study is move as fast as possible. In fact, uh, as soon as we heard about vaccines, we, we immediately said, but what about people who might not respond to vaccines so fast? We need to get studying them very quickly. I was taking phone calls on Christmas Eve and Boxing Day trying to sort this out. And 4th of February, um, before we had any funding, uh, there was an ethics submission um, and we got approval uh, five days later. Um, and then we got we got people recruited um, just 15 days after we put that ethics submission in. And it's not usually that quick. So everybody was doing everything they could. And uh, next, Paul. Yeah, so this just shows the recruitment, uh, which very quickly, um, over a matter of weeks, uh, we've managed to recruit um, several thousand people across the country uh, with a number of underlying conditions. So kidney, liver problems, cancers, and on immunosuppressive drugs for rheumatology and gastro problems. Next slide. And uh, these are just some of the questions that we regularly get asked and that we are trying as scientists to find the answers and to get the policies in place for. And we, we don't know everything yet and we can't get the answers as fast as we like. And everybody is working really, really as hard as they can seven days a week to try to get answers for this because it's very, very frustrating. Um, a lot of questions about antibody tests and I'll talk a little more on that. Um, people wondering if they can get a booster vaccine. Um, discussion about vaccines for children, in particularly children who are vulnerable, who have health conditions themselves, or the children of people who are vulnerable. Um, and people don't know if they're still supposed to be shielding. Um, they feel forgotten and uh, there needs to be more discussion about the workplace, um, what their rights. And finally, um, a lot of people are feeling very unseen and unheard by the main dialogue. So a lot of the current dialogue on vaccines is very much talking about either people who can't access a vaccine or people who choose not to have it for various reasons. And there isn't enough discussion about the people who very much wanted it, got it as soon as they could, but are now concerned that they might not respond to it. So there needs to be a wider acknowledgement of this important group of people. Next slide. So briefly about antibodies. So as I say, new virus, uh, there's been quite a scrabble to get good quality antibody tests set up to measure antibodies to the spike protein. There's quite a lot of different ways of measuring it, different platforms. And what's important is um, to have one standard, there's a WH standard, so that all the different tests can be tied together. And really, we can only learn what the antibodies mean um, if we wait and study people who have the vaccine, get their antibodies tested, and then wait and see um, some people who unfortunately get infection and compare their antibody responses with people who didn't get infection. Uh, and we need quite big numbers. So <clears throat> we don't necessarily know what the antibodies mean when we first start measuring them. And th this is unlike, um, and you've got to remember, just because you've got antibodies doesn't necessarily mean they do something. So when we diagnose HIV, we actually use an antibody test to diagnose HIV. And those antibodies aren't getting rid of your HIV. So antibodies are, are not always straightforward. Um, there's quite a lot of reports coming out now uh, trying to link antibodies to protection, but that's often at a population level. It's saying, you know, what we find is if you look at a thousand people, roughly speaking, this antibody level uh, means you're more likely uh, to, to be protected, but it's actually not so useful at an individual level. And we don't fully understand if, if you have a high antibody level, is that enough to protect you? And if you have no antibody, does that mean you've got no protection? And actually the work that Paul and I and others have done and that Paul has partly shown you suggests that um, there's many other factors like T cells that are important. Next slide. Um, everybody's asking about booster vaccines. So before COVID, in other diseases, we quite often give an e extra vaccines or double doses to people who don't make enough antibodies. So people on kidney dialysis <clears throat> often get a double dose of hepatitis B vaccine. So that, that's actually quite a normal thing to do. But with COVID first, we needed to make sure it was safe. So there's a study being done in Southampton called CovBoost, um, looking at healthy people. Um, to see what happens and that's going to be reported in August 
and we can't do it any quicker because you've got to get the vaccines in, wait a month, take the blood, analyse it. Um, and what we're currently doing is setting up studies um, based on Octave and other studies for immunocompromised people uh, to give boosters and see what happens. Um, and there's a bit of reports showing uh, that anybody's antibodies can go higher on a three doses. So it might be that three doses is better than two. Um, but you have to remember there are some people because of their underlying medical problems or uh, the medicines they take who won't make antibodies even with a lot of boosters. Um, next, please. So that's the COV boost study. And uh, this is just one particular study hot off the press. Um, people who've had a transplant, mainly kidney transplant, and what it shows is um, the first column on the left shows people be before any vaccine, and then the next one is uh, after one dose, the next one's after two doses, and the last one's after three doses, and it's the percentage of people. And you'll see that these transplant people, after two doses, only about 40% made antibodies and then after three doses it was 70 percent so this means it might be that in people with transplants a third dose is a good thing but as i say we like to see more than one study and we'll be studying this in the uk urgently next slide so finally this is my last slide and this is you know there's many many things we need but just to emphasize that scientists are working very hard thinking about people with immunocompromised right now I think we need a national acknowledgement that there's a very important minority of people who may not respond to vaccines. We need everybody to get vaccinated because if everybody else is vaccinated and makes a great response, then that helps us reach that elusive herd immunity. Um, and, and, and that's very important. Everybody doing their duty and getting vaccinated, not just for their own sake. We need these urgent trials of booster vaccines. We need these ongoing research on what we call immune correlates or protection. So that's identifying the antibody levels and T cells that you need to protect you. Um, a lot of people are saying, why can't I get an NHS antibody test? Well, you know, we would like that, but we need to know what it means. And it's also the timing of it is crucial. So we need to know what to measure when and whether that is useful information. Um, there's a lot of ongoing research as well. Um, not just on vaccines, but other ways to prevent it. So things like monoclonal antibodies for people who don't respond to vaccines, um, early treatment. So it might be that in the future, if you're known to not respond to the vaccine, uh, that the, there's a treatment like a tablet or an inhaler that you could take um, if you know you've been exposed to the virus or if you get diagnosed with it. And obviously a lot more research into how to treat severe COVID. And finally, we need policies to protect people in the workplace or to financially support. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susie and Paul. I'm going to invite Paul and Tony back. Do we have Paul as well? That was really interesting. And thank you so much for bringing different perspectives as well. Um, we've had loads of questions through, so we'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, but there's a first question that just came through. Someone who got their second dose of their vaccine yesterday, um, and they're asking, how does my immunity build up over time? And if I have stronger side effects, does this mean I'll be more immune? Over to Paul. Um, OK, well, I can answer the second bit first. So we, we're actually looking at exactly what happens like the first day after your doses. So we've, we've taken lots of blood from uh, willing volunteers to study this. And, and I think you're, um, it, it depends whether you've had the, the, um, the ADENO, the, the AstraZeneca or the, the Pfizer, but the Pfizer tends to have a much stronger response to the second dose and not so much to the first. And it's slightly the other way around for the Chadox. Um, but definitely there is a connection between um, uh, the, the things that happen on day one in your immune system and what happens many days later to get you the boost and the maximum number of T cells. Although I don't think we just necessarily joined all the dots. So we, we could, the, the slight problem is that two different people can get quite uh, different symptoms according to their, uh, even if they have the same underlying changes. So the symptoms aren't quite the giveaway, but if you are having symptoms, it definitely means that um, there's a response going on. And it, and actually, the suspicion from the data is that it's because there are already quite a lot of T cells and B cells there that are ready to respond to the, the vaccine 
um, already. So, so I think it's quite good. Um, it's an unfortunate uh, for you if you're not feeling well, but, but it's all in a good cause, I think, if you're generating a better immune response in the long run. So that's the point about vaccines. You need to tune them so that they are immunogenic enough so that they really, the immune system needs to sense danger and respond to it as if it's a kind of something to worry about. But you don't want it to be, you know, to a level that, that really causes damage. So that, that, that's why they have to hit a kind of sweet spot. Right. Susie. Yeah, and I, I would just add that these are very good vaccines as vaccines go. They're very immunogenic. And in the over 80s, the, the levels of immune responses are really, really high. In, in many people and actually a lot of older people don't get side effects but yet they still make good responses so just because you don't get side effects it doesn't mean your body's ignoring it. Yeah good to know. Did we answer the first bit about how long it takes to build up immunity after the second dose? Well I think the party line is a, sort of 10 to 14 days I think um, but uh, you know, it, it, I think if you looked at any one individual, you might well have some. As I showed, you already got something after your first dose. But you, the, the, to get the thing, the thing that we you need to focus on is not just having levels of any old antibody. You want to get those neutralizing antibody levels against the variants. And the, what happens in that process is that the B cells get further education and they refine their their, their skills. Basically, they just mutate so that they can respond better so that does take a few extra days but a couple of weeks is, is I think everybody's uh, kind of best guess uh, it's not to say you don't have anything before then it's just when it reaches a kind of peak great thank you Tony I'll do you want to take the next question oh are you muted Tony Tony do you want to unmute yourself am I I'm unmuted now okay there you go. <laughs> um, both to Professor Paul and Professor Susie. Um, the question is, what are the three key differences between natural and vaccinated immune response? Uh, I'll start with the first one. Uh, so that the, if you have a natural infection, you make responses to every kind of bit of the virus that you're exposed to. As I said, it's a large virus. So you would have, uh, if you have a vaccine, you're only seeing spike which is the very important bit. That's when you make antibodies and T-cells are very good. But if you, you can tell easily the difference because people who have had natural infection have responses to other proteins, um, the nuclear protein and, and M, and there are hundreds of proteins. Um, so that's one important difference. Um, Susie can do number two. Okay, I'll do another one. I would say that I, for most people, vaccination is more predictable. So with natural infection, it's actually, there's a huge range in outcomes and some people particularly people who have no symptoms at all can months later be left with very little immunity you can measure whilst vaccination gives a more consistent uh, response and I think uh, vaccination two doses of vaccines certainly gives you better immunity than natural infection back to Paul the third answer is is a consequence of that. So natural infection will give you kind of, as Susie said, quite good levels, but quite variable against the strain you got. But the 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 vaccine gets you such high levels that you get much better coverage of the variants. So I think that's quite an important difference that you can probably get much better protection with the vaccine just because you've lifted the antibodies and the T cells up to such much higher levels. And vaccine safer. You want to throw a fourth one in, Susie. Yeah, it's a safer route. Brilliant, thank you. I'm gonna shall I go for the next one, Tony? Are COVID vaccines blocking transmission? Do we know that yet? Um well I think there are data um that I I've seen. I'm not sure what's in the public domain. Public uh, health England data, definitely. The problem is, I think, yeah, I th it does depend on the on the variant. But but I mean, think one if the one thing that it is doing is it. I mean, it's stopping you getting infected. So if you stop infection, you're going to stop transmission. So that's the very simple answer to the question. Um, if you get infected and there is a little bit of breakthrough, but um, 
then you you probably end up with a much less infection and certainly not as long and, and not as severe. So you're less of a risk to other people. So, so those those are kind of um, hard facts. To, to understand transmission, you know, formally, you need to do a kind of population study and, and watch it happen. But but I think it's it, it's inevitable that if you you got these really robust levels of immunity, you will prevent transmission. If there was a concern at the beginning that you might end up with just a kind of partial effect, but because the I think because the the vaccines turn out to be very good, it doesn't seem to be such a major problem. Great, thank you, Tony. You're muted again. <laughs> Can you unmute yourself, Tony? Uh, right. Here we go. It says here, here we go. Uh, okay. Do we know why those who have been vaccinated are still hospitalized with COVID? Is it because they have failed to develop antibody responses? Yeah, this is a very good question. So as we move to more people being vaccinated than not, the pool of people who are unvaccinated and at risk of being hospitalized anyway gets tiny tiny so we've got to the stage where most people who were at risk of being hospitalized um, have been vaccinated and the people who are unvaccinated tend to be the young and healthy who weren't at risk anyway and and so what happens is if you start doing the maths on that you go to um, you get to the stage where inevitably there'll be a proportion of the people admitted to hospital who've been vaccinated because the sort of people who go to hospital are the older people and they've all been vaccinated. And it, 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 it just, actually, if you do the maths, you can see how effective the vaccines are. For example, if you find now that 25% um, of people admitted to hospital have had two vaccines, um, it's actually remarkable because um, that's quite a small number when you look at the age distribution of everyone. And the people who do get admitted, it, it, it might be that there was something about them that made them less likely to respond to the vaccine. Yeah, I think I think that we, we don't know, I, I guess, yet, uh, if you can predict this. But it, the vaccines in the trials, you know, they were very effective, but not 100 percent. So nothing's 100%. I mean, if everybody got vaccinated, we would still end up with, you know, and there was still some transmission, um, that we would still end up with some people in hospital. Um, the point also to make is that we are trying to study um, the breakthroughs. They're very few in the healthcare workers, but they are being measured. And they're not necessarily getting terribly ill in, that, in answer to your question, but they are getting infected. And we're trying to figure out exactly the answer that you're, you're asking. You know, is it, what's the reason? Um, is there some underlying problem with their immune system or is it just a specific thing that is, or is it just bad luck? Unfortunately, um, there's going to be a mixture of things. That's super interesting. It'll be interesting once you, you've got some data on that one, Paul. <laughs> yeah, we're, well, yeah, now we're working hard on that. Yeah, great. Next question is about mixing vaccines. So is mixing vaccines for the different doses only beneficial if you mix different platforms or could mixing, say, two of the mRNA vaccines have the same effect? Shall I take that one? Yeah, okay, yeah. Do you want to? <laughs> no, off you go, Susan. That's fine. Yeah, so we've just had the first report uh, in Oxford from what's called the COMCOV study or mix and match. And I, I, I think the bottom line was that it didn't really matter if you mixed and matched. You got good antibody and T cell responses. Um, so I think it's pretty safe to mix and match. I think the two mRNA vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna, are quite similar. And I'm pretty sure that it doesn't really make much difference to get two of them. Um, we're waiting for more studies to see if it might be even better to get one type, such as the AstraZeneca one, followed by Pfizer. Um, and we need to let the studies play out to see that. And there might even be some advantages. And I mean, we in, traditionally in the in the vaccine world, you, you, uh, well, uh, yeah, but when you've been able to, you've primed with one and boosted with another, because that focuses the immune response on the bit that's the same. In other words, the, the thing you want the immune response again. Um, but that works better than some mix. So, and, and the only real way to find out is 
miles you can't necessarily know in advance so that they, i'm really pleased that those are progressing so well yeah be interesting to see what happens with the mixing vaccines tony do you want to take the next question yes i will um erica is there any research being done for people that have highly sensitive immune systems and may not be able to receive the vaccine um, these are sort of our, our, our people who are allergic to, to, to very real problems with 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 vaccines and, and have had or, or, or suffered allergy from their first dose. Um, there are well, Susie, I think could elaborate on this more because I think this is very important. That, that there'll be a range of reasons where you either can't take the vaccine or couldn't uh, respond to it very well. Um, some of the methods are just to uh, donate antibodies from another source. So um, it's very hard to do that with T cells, but it is much easier to do that with monoclonal antibodies. And um, that sort of approach has been used in vulnerable babies for RSV, and it's used in other settings where you can't quite get the immune response in quick enough. So I think somebody who couldn't take a vaccine because of safety reasons, that would be a practical kind of route. Um, and I, I'll hand over to Susie to do, elaborate on uh, other ways that we could actually kind of protect people. Yeah, I mean, I think there's very few people who medically can't take a vaccine. Um, there's a few people where there's a concern they may have an allergy. And I think those people need to ask their GP to refer them to a clinical immunologist for discussion. Um, because I know that some centres in the UK are bringing people into hospital and giving them patch testing and this kind of thing um, to try to check it's safe. But for most people, um, the vaccines are very safe. And uh, for the very small minority, it might be that a different type of vaccine is safe for them. You know, so for some people, not Pfizer, but the Oxford one and so on. Um, and as Paul says, the, you'll be left with a very rare minority where um, the, there may be other options like the monoclonal antibodies in the future. Thank you. I think we spoke about variants in your talks, but do we know how effective the current vaccines in the UK are against the Delta variant? Susie? Susie's mm -hmm. nodding. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I know Paul knows a lot about this as well. Um, they're, they're very good. So, so there's good data from Public Health England, for example, and we see re really high vaccine effectiveness in the real world against these vaccines, against the Delta variant. I think um, if you start measuring things in the lab, you can see that the antibodies that neutralize aren't quite as good um, at the Delta as they are at um, the original um, pandemic strain uh, that the vaccines were built on. But actually the T cell work that we study shows that the T cells um, work right across the spike protein and may be less vulnerable to those mutations. Um, so actually the vaccines work pretty well. Paul, would you add? I think, so. I think the reason that the Delta has such a, been such a kind of problem is not because the vaccines are not working. As you can see from the kind of effectiveness of, or in, in the hospital uh, in patients and, and deaths has not shifted so much. But again, as Susie said, in the lab, there is a, they, they, they are mutants, so the, the mutants do affect the way some of the antibodies bind, but they're, no particularly work, they're not particularly more, more uh, difficult to neutralize than say the the, the alpha strain or the Kent strain. Um, the real problem is it's very sticky and transmissible. So the, the thing is spreading very fast, but, but it still can be blocked by the vaccines, just by those antibodies and, and T cells that are induced against the original strain. But you do need to have higher levels to get, as a, for all the variants, you need a higher level of antibody, high level of T cell to get the robust protection. Um, that, that's just the, the fact in the last few months. Thank you both. I think very so, reassuring. So, so since we're on the whole issue of antibody response, a good follow up question seems to be, are there any studies yet on how common it is to have no antibody response to the vaccine? Well, I think there are different sorts of studies. So, so there are studies that are mentioned octave study where, you know, you've got a group of patients who are generally going to have more problems making immune responses against new things. And I, th I think one of the things, this is not really fully read out yet, but one of the things that's going to be important is there may, there may be people whose B cells are just really not functioning at all or have been on a drug to 
to remove their B cells via Corituxin. Um, and they're clearly going to have a problem uh, making antibodies. They will potentially be able to make T cells. Uh, but there are also people whose antibodies are low. And so those might be slightly different groups of patients. So the, the patients with low antibodies are like the ones that Susie played in the graph who, who might respond to the vaccine. And I don't know if you saw, if we had to look at the graph, but there were still some people after three doses who were still in the bottom line. So I guess what you'd like to know, Tony, is like, could you predict those people in advance and actually kind of put them in a different stream and, and do something? I think, I think hopefully over time, and that's one of the aims of Octave, we are going to hopefully be able to make better predictions about this. Um, at the moment, you have to just do, give everybody the same thing and wait and see. But if we can understand a bit more about why, um, then I think we'll be in a better position. I don't know if you want to add anything, Susie. Yeah, no, I just agree with what you said. And we already know before COVID, um, as I said, uh, for things like patients on uh, kidney dialysis, we give them a, a bigger dose of hepatitis B because scientific research has shown they're more likely to need that higher dose. And, but, you know, we, we don't want to just go around giving double doses to everyone. So we have to do the studies to work that out first. But having said that, there are clearly people in those groups who make actually pretty good responses to the yeah. regular thing. So I think it's that's that's one of the bits we need to figure out. I mean, as I already said at the beginning, there's a ma massive range in, in healthy people um, and there's a big range in people who are on, on, on therapy. And we, we don't know everything to measure in the blood. So if you look after a single dose, um, of vaccine, you'll, you'll find that people's neutralizing antibodies are actually quite low. Um, but, but actually, if you look at the data, a single dose actually gives loads of protection at a population level against being admitted to hospital. So there's all sorts in your immune system that, that is working after vaccine, not just simple antibody tests. Yeah. Tony, did you want to have I can see him, he's talking, but he's on mute. <laughs> he's, <laughs> we can't hear that. you. There we go. Right, right, we okay. Right, okay. Uh, um, now, I, I've heard Paul, Professor Paul and Professor Susie speak at our um, public patient involvement um, um, and also at the advisory board that I sit on. And you, you know I'm very much into equity, equality, diversity, and inclusion. Um, so far, you haven't sort of really touched at all. And I'm sure there are people listening in on this of the 260 odd people who are also both white, African, Caribbean, Asian, are interested in where does this all fit in the whole essence of the African, Caribbean, Asian community who we know have succumbed far more to the virus in terms of acute um, hospitalization, who have died as well and so on all this research that you're doing um you spoke about age you spoke about sex you didn't include ethnicity in any of it um i hope you're not leaving us out of the equation is what i'm well, asking I, I, Tony, I'm very grateful. I'm grateful. I'm taken what you've said completely on board and spent some time trying to address this so i think in our bigger studies the, the problem is partly the size of the study and making sure that we got as good an information as we can but in these bigger studies where we have gone to uh, collect the information as, as best we can about ethnicity, we are now in the process of analysing that this week. So um, we will get a better idea of whether, but we're only asking the question about what the response to vaccine is and whether the vaccine um, regimens have an, an impact in the different ethnicities or different ages and different sexes. But the, and ethnicity is one of the questions that we would like to address. And I, I do appreciate that it has been neglected. You gave some terrible statistics about how uh, most studies don't even in, incorporate it. Um, but I, so we have made sure that we can do that. Um, Susie, do you want to elaborate further? Yeah, so Tony, thank you. You spoke to all of us scientists at our national meeting and you know we heard it's actually a disgrace um, how Britain has handled uh, addressing ethnic differences um, in terms of the research reporting to date and we, we really listened to that and our current study that we're writing up uh, we've tracked down um, ethnicity information on as many participants as we can um, and we are analysing the data that way um, this in it, and this in itself is is full of challenges because in the UK, in our healthcare worker study, we're, we're 
really proud in Britain to have a huge range of ethnicities. And what we're very wary of is lumping people together. So we're just trying to work out the best way to do that. Um, but we're certainly going to do our very best uh, to address this. But we don't want to lump people, black people, Asian people, you know, all in one group because they may be more different to each other than they are to white people. So we've just got to work out the best way to do it, to bring out differences. And, and we want to do our very best job on that. Great. Well, we'll look forward to seeing that when, when it does come through, definitely. Um, we had a question, because we talked a lot about antibodies, but can you provide more detail on the role of T cells in protection in the absence of a good antibody response? Oh, then um, somebody's, I think Susie's mum must have asked that question. But uh, <laughs> uh, the, the, this is our, you know, we're very interested in the world of T cells. And, and one of the things that's difficult in this field is that if you give up, and we know that T cells and antibodies are good different roles to play. And if you do careful m model studies in, in, in animals where you can take the things away, you can actually probe experimentally the importance of each in protection against, say, flu or this or that. But in humans, all you can do is really look at correlation and genetics and so forth. But so far with the, with the vaccine um, or natural infection, the antibodies in the T cells tend to go up and down together. So it's really hard. But in a paper that we did publish uh, earlier in the year, we found a group of individuals who were frontline healthcare workers who didn't seem to have any trace of an antibody that we could find. They had been infected um, and they had, some of them had quite good T cell responses. Um, so, so the T cells were sort of the giveaway. And as, as I mentioned, they were against different bits of the virus and we were very confident they had T cells. And it looked to us like they cleared the virus without an, mounting an antibody response. That wouldn't be unique to this infection. We see that in other places, uh, hep hepatitis C, which I've spent a lot of time looking at. You can get exactly that. Um, most people will tend to make an antibody, but it, it is quite possible that there's a subset of people where the T cells are kind of the giveaway. You have to be careful because some of the assays, is, you know, that you're not comparing, uh, you're comparing different sorts of assay and our, our T cell assay is actually very, very sensitive. So they may have made an antibody and lost it or something like that. But, but certainly you can get that situation. Uh, we, I'm a, we're big fans of T cells. We know that they can be protective in flu and there's no particular reason why they wouldn't be equally protective in COVID. Susie, did you want to add anything for your mum? No, I think he explained it beautifully. Excellent. I think we may have time for one final question. Tony, do you want to ask the last question? Yes, I, I have one which is a sort of more personal and it's the giving of blood. Um, people who have had the virus, are they able to donate blood? Is that an issue? Is the blood screened efficiently and effectively or um, are they told, no, it's best you, you're not, <laughs> not give any blood? No, well, actually, yeah, all the antibodies are. The blood samples were looking for people who'd been infected to donate blood. Um, you, you do have, and the reason was that they wanted people with high levels of antibodies to give in one of these passive therapies and see if it could work. I mean, the overall effect was actually a bit disappointing. Uh, there's a trace of an effect if, in people who haven't had, um, haven't made their own antibody. So even if you're, you're sick in hospital, by the time you get into kind of the second week, you, you might have made an antibody. In those people, adding an extra antibodies might help. That hasn't really worked so well, but, but they were actually recruiting people who'd had severe COVID and, 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 and using their, their blood. The, there is, it is possible to find a little bit of COVID um, sequence, a little bit of RNA in blood in the first few days of infection in the sickest people. We've never found any really uh, a virus that you can actually culture. So if there is some, it's, it's by the time you've recovered from it and able to give blood and well enough, then there's no risk. Yeah, it's not a bloodborne virus. So after having COVID, you can give blood, but I'd probably suggest waiting a month to make sure you're better. Great, thank you. I'm just aware of the time, so I think we might have to start wrapping it up. So I firstly just want to thank Tony for, for co-chairing with me. Thank you so much for taking those questions, Tony, and asking your own You're questions, welcome. definitely really important, and representing our PPI panel. So I do want to thank our PPI panel as well, who meet with our researchers on a regular basis and have been really providing, <laughs> that's so nice, Susie, <laughs> who've really been providing the perspective of patients and public groups. Um, so we, we are really representing lots of different groups in the UK CIC and questioning the researchers on the research that they're doing. 
And then I really want to thank Paul and Susie. So thank you so much for giving up your Tuesday evening and missing the football. Um, but we really, really appreciate you doing this. And thank you everyone who's been watching. Um, do check out the UKCIC website, do look us up. There's loads more information on our website about the research that's being conducted within UKCIC. So do keep an eye out on there. But thank you all so much for joining us. And thank you, Paul and Susie. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.